Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vagam Radian at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where we're co covering the Space Security Conference. And we have uh, Tom Carrico here, who is a senior fellow here at CSIS. And you're the uh, missile uh, defense, uh, your man who watches missile, missile defense here. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, your program is, is sponsored from a whole range of sources, from foundations to some in industry, some on missile defense, but, but, right. uh, but more broadly as well. Um, what I wanted to start off, Tom, is how is the missile threat evolving? Obviously, we had a North Korean, uh, you know, North Korea has been very, very active, worryingly active, uh, working to pair its nuclear, uh, smaller generation of nuclear warheads with a newer generation of long-range boosters. Talk to us, not just from a North Korean perspective, but also what's happening with Iran, but also with some classical players, whether they're Russia and China. Where's the missile threat going? Right. So, you know, I think that the, uh, let's start with North Korea. Uh, what we saw, the, the level of activity, the number of missile tests that Kim Jong-un has done in the past three years is well more than, than, than his father and grandfather combined over, over 30 years. Uh, he is way uh, ramping up not merely the number of tests, but also the quality and the kind of characteristics of the missiles. So he's getting more solid, more mobile, uh, and longer range in what he's doing. There's a lot of failures in there, but that's part of the process. And even from the failures, I think, uh, A, they learn something every time, and B, uh, uh, it really displays his intent. Now, moving outside of North Korea, it's not just a North Korea problem. We see Iran continuing their missile uh, program, uh, violating at least the spirit, uh, if not the letter, of, of the uh, 2231 UNSCR United Nations uh, resolution uh, implementing JCPOA. They're really pushing the and, limit there. And that's the technical name for the Iran nuclear deal, the multinational the, the Iran, Iran nuclear deal. deal. And, the, and so the U.N. came in, loosened the missile sanctions a little bit, restrictions, but still said don't be doing missile tests that are designed for, for delivering nuclear weapons. Well, Iran keeps doing it. And if you take a look at their neighbors, uh, they're putting real money, real billions behind uh, uh, various sort of low-tier and medium-tier uh, missile defense interceptors because they're not buying it that Iran is not a, a missile threat. Uh, and so they're hedging there, and I think they're putting real dollars, uh, uh, Middle East dollars, uh, behind it. But it's not merely an Iran and nuclear, uh, North Korea thing either. Uh, China is doing a lot of stuff that has its other neighbors, uh, I think, concerned. And Russia is, you know, put aside the ICBMs and put aside the SLBMs, mobile and otherwise. Uh, they've got a lot of short-range stuff Iskanders and, and as well cruise missiles, uh, some of which are apparently INF treaty violating. Uh, that's not very nice. Uh, it also points to the fact that they uh, may have a, an intent with respect to arms control agreements and a, an intent with respect to uh, their posture on NATO uh, that's not a very uh, friendly one. And so NATO has kind of come to grips with the fact that it has a Russia problem in a big way. I think NATO is still coming to grips with the fact that it has uh, an air and missile Russia problem as well. And so, you know, uh, fortunately, we're, we're moving ahead with the, uh, with the Aegis Ashore sites in Europe uh, that are really designed against kind of out-of-area Middle Eastern and other threats. Uh, but I think actually NATO needs to think more uh, and uh, more sharply about the kind of low-tier air and missile defense uh, that it needs with respect to, to Russia. Um, and I want to take you to that point. Obviously, uh, NATO now does have a declared missile defense mission. Obviously, as you said, it's aimed not at Russia, but it is aimed at any threat from the from the Middle East. Obviously, a bone of contention between Moscow and 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 uh, the NATO alliance about whether it's aimed at uh, blunting the the Russian uh, nuclear deterrent. Um, tell us a little bit. Uh, but, you know, I want to go to from a missile defense standpoint. You know, we just saw an interesting uh, dynamic in Israel. Uh, R Russia now, obviously, with triple-digit SAMs, is in Syria. And now that's changed the rules and the strategic dynamic with Israel that used to be able to operate in Syria with impunity, yeah. and no longer we saw an incident. What, what, what did that incident tell us about how the introduction of highly capable missile defenses into a, into a theater can change the dynamic? So let, me actually talk to, let me actually talk to two incidents. Uh, with respect to Israel, uh, and they really are kind of globally interconnected. Uh, first of all, you mentioned the kind of S-400s in Syria. You know, I find it fascinating and curious why it's okay for Russia to have S-400s in Syria uh, and S-400s and other things in Kaliningrad uh, that, you know, the defended area, 
defendant airspace reaches well into Poland and NATO countries. Why is that okay and not destabilizing? Oh, but oh, by the way, you put the least little patriot into Poland or you put fad into South Korea and oh, the sky is falling. This is so destabilizing. Whoa, whoa, you know, woe is us. Uh, that's just hypocrisy. Uh, that's not intellectually consistent. Uh, I think what that reflects is Russia and China uh, bam attempting to bamboozle us and just trying to have uh, their neighbors be relatively more undefended. I think that is not, uh, as uh, Secretary of State Tillerson pointed out, uh, that's not helpful uh, and it's uncalled for. Uh, and I think we have to kind of recognize that this is, a, this is a sham, this opposition to really low-tier, reasonable air and missile defenses. I, I think that that's actually a first uh, for the Defense and Aerospace Report, where I think somebody has used the word bamboozle, oh, I, which, is, which is great. It's, it's a, a great word. It's a, we, it's a weekly word for me, so <laughs> I have to come back. Uh, but the second piece is uh, the second event this past week uh, with respect to Israel was the apparent use uh, in anger uh, of an Arrow 2 uh, interceptor. Uh, against, of all things, uh, apparently a Syrian uh, SAM. So apparently, according to news reports, uh, a, a surface air missile fired from Syria against an Israel uh, aircraft uh, that was intercepted, of all things, by this. And what, what I would draw from that uh, is kind of the unpredictability of the threat. That, you know, when they designed the Arrow 2, they were probably thinking about missiles from a little further away, and they weren't thinking about SAMs, but that really speaks to kind of the unpredictability of it all. Talk to us a little bit about, it. obviously, we have a new administration. Uh, the new administration has been very bullish, or at least made the case why missile defense investment is important. Um, that doesn't mean that it wasn't important also for the last administration, because there was obviously a considerable amount of investment there. But looking into the future, what are the kind of capabilities, from your standpoint as somebody who studies this field, does the Trump administration need to focus on? What are the kind of capabilities the United States and its allies need in an integrated basis for the future? Yeah, so uh, two things. One, I think the Obama administration did a lot of stuff with respect to both homeland and regional that it advanced it. Missile defense has matured a lot since kind of the 2004 time frame when uh, homeland missile defenses were deployed. We've come a long way since then. Having said that, it's also indisputable that the top line budget for the Missile Defense Agency has fallen by 24% in adjusted dollars uh, in the past decade. Uh, so that was that was during the Obama administration. So there's no question that the budget has gone way down. Uh, and that in relative terms, where the, the Obama administration budget request the last time around was Clinton uh, administration era uh, levels. So, the administration's point would be that we were in a budget control act and, yeah, and compressed course, environment. No, but but there was some terms. also philosophical difference there in, initially as well. Though. Yeah, in relative terms. Uh, but but to the second part of your question is, okay, now what about the Trump administration? And I think that, that the... Uh, Trump administration has, has indicated in the campaign and some other um, uh, statements that uh, they're likely to do more. Uh, I think that especially homeland missile defense seems a likely object of focus. Uh, in part, I think any, frankly, whoever would have, would have been the administration now would probably be doing more in homeland uh, missile defense because of where North Korea is at. Um, and so I hope also that the uh, various regional and force protection uh, missions uh, continue uh, and continue to expand and grow. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And one particular area that I would highlight that the Trump administration uh, emphasized during the campaign season was a space sensor layer. Uh, that was specifically identified, and we just had a panel today, uh, just now, with the deputy director of the Missile Defense Agency and others talking about that. You may have moderated that panel. I, I may have. <laughs> and really, as I like to point out, the last five presidential administrations have had a space sensor layer for persistent birth-to-death tracking and discrimination. Five administrations have had it on paper as a critical part of our national missile defense. None of them have actually done it. And so now I think there's an opportunity to, to actually do what everybody has long known is really a critical part to, to maturing your long-range missile defenses. When you're talking about domestic defenses, though, I mean, once upon a time, right, if you go back into the 50s, uh, obviously there were national sites all, all over. Um, there was um, obviously an agreement with the Russians to not do that, reducing it to one ABM site. We eventually dropped out of that agreement, uh, ultimately, uh, in order to allow us to set up our ground-based uh, defenses aimed specifically at, at, at Korea. Um, it's a two-part question. Part one of the question is, is the capability that we have currently fielded sufficient to intercept 
the kind of growing threat from the North Koreans because that was set up at a time when rogue missile, one missile, not a nation that may have a battery of nuclear weapons and a battery of missiles that it can fire and potentially reach the United yeah. States. That's the first part, and then I've got to follow up. Yeah, so the first part of that is, you know, the good news is, uh, as you noted, the Bush administration did withdraw from the ABM Treaty pursuant to its terms because we've seen this problem coming for a while, right? That was back in 2002. Uh, GMD became operational in 2004, uh, and here we are today. And we've seen the North Korea threat coming for a long time, except now, now they seem to be getting a lot closer. And so the real question becomes, okay, what if they not only demonstrate sort of a different kind of mobile, solid ICBM, something like that, um, but then they start serial production of them? Well, we've got 40, up, up, we will have 44 GBIs, uh, ground-based interceptors, in Alaska and California by the end of this calendar year. That's a good thing. Uh, that puts us in a relatively advantageous position. Uh, but should should Korea uh, get there, and should we still have to fire several interceptors at any given uh, threat, uh, that capacity uh, is going to be challenged. So I think, I think this administration, uh, their instincts to do more on that are probably exactly right in terms of growing capacity numbers, uh, uh, improving capability, perhaps a multiple object kill vehicle, uh, and lots of more, lots of sensors, and going back to the space sensor layer. A space sensor layer helps every aspect of missile defense, from the low-tier Patriot stuff to Aegis and Thab, as well as to the higher-tier stuff. How quickly can that be fielded, however? Because if you look at the North Korean threat, it's moving very rapidly. You know, we talked to Mike Green here, obviously, you know, uh, the Asia chair, you know, watches Japan, watches China, but also watches North Korea. And his concern was that Kim Jong-un just if you just track the number of executions and purges that are happening, it indicates somebody who's trying to clutch to power. And in that case, the guy may feel like I've got nothing to lose. Hey, I can I can try to precipitate and to and to to go up the the escalatory ladder. So I think the uh, the answer to that is uh, right. We for for twenty some years we've said we don't want to be in position of being blackmailed by North Korea. Got it. Uh, so the, the, that's why a, an overall posture of Let's try to outpace the threat rather than chase the threat uh, is a good place to be. Uh, and so we're going to have to keep doing that. Uh, again, 44 GBIs to uh, a small number of ICM, that's a good thing. Uh, we are going to have to, that's why I said before, grow in all these different ways. And let me take you to what is likely would be a dicey thing. If missile defenses need to be expanded in the United States, you know, it's one thing to say that we've posted them up in Alaska in a fairly unpopulated area. But at some point, does there have to be a national discussion where the nation may need more extensive missile defenses that may have to be stationed in other parts of the United States? Well, you know, there, there are, the GBIs in Alaska and California can do a lot of things. They were explicitly designed to be able to cover all 50 states. Uh, but that's not to say that it doesn't challenge the envelope of what they can do. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of good reasons to have a distributed architecture, to have interceptors in a lot of places, so you don't have to, as it were, reach out and touch from further away, whereas you can reach from, from shorter distances. And so I think actually the trend line that you see for the global demand for uh, lots more interceptors among our allies and partners, uh, that also applies to the United States forces and the United States territory. And so there, there could well be... Um, other interceptor sites, maybe it's TBIs, maybe it's other things. And we've seen kind of very promising, I think, uh, uh, inter an intercept of the, of the SM-32A that the U.S. has co-produced with Japan. You know, those things really blur the line between regional and homeland missile defense. So they could have applications. And uh, two, two last questions. First, would stationing missile defense ships offshore be one potential solution to that problem? I know that from a Navy perspective, it's, boy, you know, tying up a lot of, a you know, you need a lot of assets in order to do that. But it is a great system, as you mentioned, in service, uh, tied to a great battle management system. Could that be a potential solution that, that sort of gets around the political dynamic of that, even though it may have some very significant budgetary implications? Uh, in, in principle, yes. And so if you want to defend Hawaii today, uh, that might be a piece of, of how you go about doing that. Uh, but the other answer is why, why have the ship run circulates, you know, off the coast when what we've been doing for NATO, and I think what we might do for uh, U.S. bases elsewhere, make a lot of sense, uh, is take the, uh, the launch tubes and take the deck house off of the ship, put it on land, put it in a field somewhere. And then it kind of has a defended area, 
yeah, it leverages all that technology, uh, the, the sort of proven system of the Aegis, uh, and also a lot of flexibility about what you use it for. Uh, so that's something that I think could have application to uh, U.S. military bases. Uh, but uh, Japan might very well decide to go that way for, for putting it on land as well as at sea. But sure, it could, it could have... Uh, in principle, homeland defense applications as well. Let me take you to the last question, which is um, there's an enormous amount of investment that's been going into rail guns, for example, lasers, you know, obviously uh, ABL, uh, the Airborne Laser Program that was terminated by uh, Secretary Gates uh, in the very beginning of the Obama administration because he looked at it as a science project, uh, you know, that was never going to field a capability. But as you look at lasers and particularly rail guns, um, you know, what's the role for directed energy and such, you know, uh, non-explosive kinetic sort of systems in a layered missile defense system? So I would have, um, first of all, I would be hesitant to kind of completely accept that characterization of Gates' motive. Uh, I think that the, the ABL uh, advanced, you know, science projects do advance the, the science and technology I, as well. I, so, I wrote, I wrote it, I was a big supporter of the program. I wrote at the time that it should be preserved, but, uh, but, 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 and so actually where we are today, talking about directed energy on UAVs uh, with very different concepts of operation, I don't think we'd be where we are today if not for uh, that, that ABL and other programs like it. So, so that's a good thing. Um, I think that there's a lot of promise for that. Uh, there's also been a lot of promise for that for a long time. Uh, we're not helped when Congress and CRs, uh, both both actual cuts in appropriations and CRs more broadly, uh, keep taking the already very limited directed energy missile defense budget and getting rid of it or cutting it in half or cutting it in thirds. That that doesn't help that, that wave of the future. Uh, and the other thing is, however, while I think we're very likely to see more directed energy of various kinds for short-range threats, uh, uh, rockets, artillery, and mortars, uh, cruise missiles, things like that. For the long-range stuff, uh, we're probably going to be a little further away. For the, for the foreseeable future, we're probably going to have chemically-powered rockets killing other chemically-powered rockets. Uh, and I think it's important not to take our eye off, off of that. Uh, and while well, we have to evolve our interceptors uh, to kind of deal with new and evolving endo-atmospheric threats, uh, we're going to have to keep building interceptors of some kind, I think, for the foreseeable future. Um, but seeing as how um, I'm, I'm uh, uh, to, to channel my inner Andy Marshall, uh, are you on the wrong side of the cost curve if you're using multi-million dollar interceptors to shoot down several hundred thousand dollar uh, threats, whether they're DF-21s, 26s, you know, Iskanders or anything yeah. else? So I, think, I don't think anybody uh, objects to the idea that we want to inflect the cost curve. Uh, of course, it's really more of an affordability curve than a cost curve or cost ratio. Uh, we're also talking about kind of the, uh, the cost of the protected asset. The Aegis ship that you protect is pretty expensive too. Uh, so that factors into it. But as long as we have a strategy that we're not willing to kind of accept vulnerability, then we've got to come at the problem and, and, and find uh, ways to have some degree uh, of defensive capability in terms of just as we do for air defense or for uh, missile defense of various kinds. But sure, everybody wants to inflect the cost curve. And I think there's probably in terms of con ops, in terms of uh, mass production and kind of cooperative things with our allies. There's, I think there's a lot of ways to get after that. Tom, thanks be very much for being yep. so generous with your time. All right. Thank you very much. Enjoy it. Thank you.